It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with certified financial planners Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. Thanks for being here, friends. I'm Mike Bernard. I'm your host. I'm also one of the certified financial planners on the program. With me in the KFG studios, my business partners and fellow CFPs, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Today, we're hitting even more crucial financial decisions where stakes are high, emotions run strong, and the consequences of making a mistake are even more impactful. We're going to continue our discussion from last week. We've got that and more coming up on this hour's episode of The Wise Money Show. Well, it wasn't intended to be a series, but it turned into one. We hit uh, the crucial financial decisions last week, and there's just more. There's more of them that you need to be aware of and be prepared for. We're going to help you with that right now. If you have a question for the program, we'd love to hear from you. You can call or text us, 574-222-2000. That's 574-222-2000. Online, wisemoneyshow.com is where you can submit questions and get a whole bunch of other content as well. And then all over social media, wherever you're at, we are there as well. Hitting questions, second half of the program. Also, uh, special thanks to uh, sponsor Auto Owners for sponsoring the final segment of the program. So we'll, we'll be hitting questions later. All right. So are there are there certain financial decisions that are outsized? They maybe have an outsized impact on your overall long-term financial balance and success? And of course, that answer is yes. How do you know that? Well, because you know that where you decide to go to eat tonight is a less important than how much are you going to save or when you're going to retire. There's obviously more important financial decisions than others. And last week, we'd intended to hit the top five crucial financial decisions. And by crucial, we mean stakes are high, so it's not just an inconsequential decision. Um, emotions run strong, and there could be differing opinions. That's the second qualification. And then the third is if you get if you make a mistake, make the wrong choice, the consequences are significant. Okay, um, we hit the top five last last week. When to retire? How much to be saving up, and when you start saving up for retirement? How much house to buy? Whether you should do pre tax or Roth? And then how much insurance coverage? Your insurance coverage decisions. But we left some meat on the bones. We didn't hit everything. And so we just want to open it with what are some other crucial financial decisions that meet that criteria? Guys, what do you got? Well, okay, so re- repeat those again. It's the, the three tra- criteria were stakes, high, high stakes. Yeah, stakes are high. Emotions could run high or have differing emotions. Yep. And then um, the, the consequences if right. you make the wrong choice. Yeah, so if you, if you order chicken tonight instead of steak... It's not that big of a problem, right? Or uh, if unless you, the chicken wasn't cooked right. <laughs> well, that's I, right. That's I don't right. know. <laughs> right. So making a mistake could have significant consequences. Yeah. It, you know, I I think this one maybe meets those three criteria, but I, I certainly throw it in the category of most one of the most important decisions that you're going to make in your in your life, and it will have financial implications and. Yes, maybe emotions may differ, especially if your future father-in-law doesn't approve of you. <laughs> but who you marry, yeah. uh, it has to make the list, right? Yeah. I, I mean, you talk about one of the most important relationships that you're going to have in your entire lifetime, and clearly, y- you being on the same page financially with your spouse is a really big deal, and it's it's easier to get that wrong than it is to get it right. It takes real work and everything. But when people don't, you know, that they don't have alignment in their in their values or in their goals, in the priorities that they're focused on financially, it really can be a major source of conflict. So often it's the major source of conflict in a lot of people's marriages. Yeah, and I would, so I'd be careful about that because if you're sitting there right now and realizing, boy, <laughs> did I marry a fixer upper? <laughs> like, what in the world did I do? Um, <clears throat> As so, three fixer uppers here, we we can relate. No, but <laughs> no, so I so I think before you get married, one of the biggest financial decisions you'll make in your life is who who you marry or how do you marry. Um, after you're married and you've made a covenant before God and man, then the biggest one of the biggest financial decisions you'll make. And I would th- I would make uh, these uh, probably. I'm going to take a two for here. It's how do you lead your spouse? Because it doesn't really matter if, if you're a man or a woman. 
you're leading your spouse. Yeah, you're, you have you're, influence. You're in right. If leadership is defined as influence, how are you influencing your spouse? And I so I would I would do an add on to this one, and I would say, if your spouse, if who you choose to marry matters, and how you then lead that person, how you influence that person matters, then for sure one of the biggest financial decisions that you're going to make as well is, who is your friend group going to be? Hmm. Because when you look at the, 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 the sum of your, your five closest friends, you're the, probably the average of those mm-hmm. statistically. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so this is where you say, all right, well, am I going to have friends that I feel like I'm always going to be striving to keep up with? Or am I going to have friends that are going to be satisfied coming over and playing cribbage on a Friday night and they're happy Mm -hmm. and uh, they could go to the nicest uh, steakhouse in town, but they don't, they don't need that to be able to taste the salt. Hmm. And, and this is, I've, I've observed this with folks with money and it seems like it's, it's, it's either one or the other Um, folks that have kind of out, have had outsized um, financial gain in their life, they're either they they are trying to taste the salt and, and by spending inordinate amounts of money on things that might not even matter or might seem either really e- extravagant or luxurious, or they're the far other end of the extreme. And it was interesting because this past weekend we were traveling and um, we had a I don't know, basic rental car, you know, and it, it was a nice car. And my son Joshua said, Dad, could we have gotten a nicer car? And I said, I think we probably could have. Uh, <laughs> I would have said, no. <laughs> rental cars are in very short supply right now, son. This is an economics lesson. <laughs> but it doesn't, but, you know, how much nicer? Like yeah. twice as nice, four times as nice? 10 times as nice. And I said, it doesn't, it's it, it, a rental car is a very, you, t- you know, it, it, it has a very basic purpose. And this car is serving the purpose. I really don't care. And for me, tasting the salt is getting a good deal on a rental car. <laughs> it's not, hey, I got the coolest looking rental car and I turned some heads when I pulled up in it. Mm-hmm. I like that you connected the group of friends with marriage because the right group of friends will support you in your marriage as well. Oh, right? absolutely. When you run into stressful times, um, maybe in your marriage or just hard events in life, having people beside you who can help pick you up and carry you for a while is is really critical. And, you know, I, I remember um, going back to uh, who you marry mattering so much. One, one example of that, there was a study that was done, I think, by Carnegie Mellon, and they were they, they were showing evidence, I guess, that who you have as your spouse can matter even in your career success. Hmm. And they attributed it to uh, who is this? Do you have a spouse who's very supportive to you in taking risks or, um, you know, accepting challenging assignments, that sort of thing? The, the types of things that often lead to success in someone's career, you don't get it done on your own. You know, if if you're stressed out at home, you're going to take stress with you into the office or into your your career and vice versa, I suppose. But um, th- this idea that a spouse is there to be your number one cheerleader and this is, you know, husbands to wives yeah. and wives to husbands. It, it's true in both directions. But, um, you know, you, you talk about a way to have financial success. Um, b- being supported well at home is a big one. Well, so so you've got to invest in your marriage, but there's some other things that you can do to ensure that the decision on who you marry ends up being fruitful and beneficial in your financial life. So we've got that and more coming up on The Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Hello, YouTube. Thanks for being here. This is The Wise Money Show. You're at The Wise Money Show channel. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and smash that thumbs up button. What you're watching right now is our weekly one-hour talk show that airs right here on this channel, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time every Saturday morning, also on podcasts at the same time, but also on a few local radio stations in our uh, in our region, which is why the content is 
broken up the way that it is and this this size. If you're into more content or want maybe more palatable content, five, 10, eight minutes long, uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, because all throughout the work week, we've got next Y step videos that air right here on this channel. Um, you know, what's in the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, and will it reduce inflation? It won't, but we've got topics uh, like that and a lot more. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you're aware every time we drop new content. And if you like the content, like the content. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Kevin we, gave you the finger. Uh, yeah, we need to. I, I don't, I want to go quickly. We yeah, we got to go. Hit, we got to hustle. Yeah, but for sure. But there is, there's, there's some, I don't know if we made an application with marriage <coughs> yet. And I, I, th I'd like to. Well, yeah, let's do let's, that real quick. Let's for sure do Good that. timing there. As you're, mm -hmm. as you're muting your. And then can we go, can, can we go to the college one? Or do you want to go to kids or I something think... that maybe is more financially direct or. I don't sure. Know. So yeah. maybe, maybe college. Yeah. So, okay. Um. Carnegie Mellon University, the other CMU. Mm, the, uh, yeah, second second fiddle we, there. We would be, uh, we, and I think they have the maroon and gold colors, too. Copycats. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'm Copy. sick of it. <laughs> Everyone's just trying to be central. Mm. The uh, Central Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Harvard of Mount Pleasant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Backstreet to the uh, casino there. I thought that was. Anyway. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> what are the crucial financial decisions in your life? And then how do you approach those financial decisions the right way so that you have. Uh, you know, a, a better chance of making a great decision. We're helping you with that right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Every episode of the Wise Money Show is on the YouTube channel. Go check it out. Uh, go to YouTube, search the Wise Money Show. Subscribe to it there. Turn on notifications because not only is every episode of the talk show there, but lots of other content as well. So make sure you, you scoop that up. All right. We're talking about, we're just continuing our discussion from last week on crucial financial decisions. Those financial decisions that are more important have outsized impact on your financial life. Stakes are high, so it's not an inconsequential decision. Opinions may vary. And there might be different opinions. Um, and, uh, and, and third, if you make a mistake, is significant financial consequences. Now, the one that we started with today is, is who you marry. And you might say, okay, yep, I, I get, I can see that. Um, is there any application here, guys? And there is. It's not. It's not that you know you've got to marry um, Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. But instead, from a financial standpoint, regardless of who you marry, here's the two ways I would apply this. Number one, how are you investing in that marriage? It's personally is a struggle for me. Kids have us running ragged, and Cindy unfortunately married someone who's very frugal. It's hard. It's hard to get away for a weekend, and it's it, so it's hard to find time and you know, pry the pennies away from the fingers that are clutching it. Um, so date nights, those sorts of things. How are you investing in your marriage? And those could be, you know, walks. Those could be weekend getaways. Those could be vacations. It's it, how are you investing in your marriage? That's one. Number two, it's not so much about, well, I needed to marry up or marry someone without financial baggage or marry someone that's got a good career. That's, that's not, that's not the ticket. Okay. The point is, then this is the second application, getting on the same page with your spouse financially. Mm -hmm. Well, how does that happen? Does that happen automatically on its own um, when pigs fly? <laughs> the way you get financially on the same page with your spouse is a couple times a year going in together and meeting with your certified financial planner who's doing comprehensive financial planning. So oftentimes, your CFP is, is compared to um, a shrink or a marriage counselor, not because they're giving any wisdom on your relationship, but it's just a safe place for you to air out, hey, where are we financially and where do we want to go? And are we doing the things that'll get us on track? And so it's, it's not about this financial decision, who you marry. It's not about marrying right or marrying up or marrying someone without credit card debt. So don't hear this to say, well, my fiance is loaded with student loans. Maybe they're saying this is the wrong person. It's not. I, that's not what we're saying at all. No, but what could make that person the wrong person who's loaded up with student loan debt is that in your attempts to 
communicate with that person and get on the same page. You're just not able to do that or they're not willing to go there because that's when you if you're if you're if you're doing some sort of litmus test, is this the right person? This has got to be a per. If you look at the things that make marriage difficult or make uh, or, or in, help marriages fail, it is the the financial stuff. Yeah. And so, if you can't get together on the finances, and in my opinion, you'd figure out how to approach your finances before you got married. Mm-hmm. I, I was just gonna say, and we're working on you know, Wise Money University and, and, and a, a online or virtual type of class. Uh, it's not there. It's not available yet. So I wonder, as you're doing premarital counseling during that engagement period, do you and your your fiance go through Dave Ramsey, financial peace? I, I, yes. To me, and mm-hmm. so you can align your, I mean, get a lot out in the open, but also align your thinking on finances. But it's important, as you said, to stay in alignment as well. And, and you talked about uh, two meetings per year with a certified financial planner. But it's the the weekly or the ongoing connection points that are just as important. Uh, we we have some friends who told us about something they've been doing for most of their marriage called Marriage Mondays, and it's the two of them having what almost seems like a little bit of a business meeting, um, but it starts out with sharing with each other. Here's the the top thing that I appreciated about you over this past week. So it starts with a positive focus in a way. But then you, you're talking about the events that you need to be aware of. Like, are we on the same page? Are we both, you know, living life together? Are there issues that we need to solve together? And then what are the decisions we need to make together? And a lot of times those have some sort of financial implications mm-hmm. or budgetary implications. And if you're not talking about those things because you are living life at a million miles an hour and sometimes in the opposite direction – then sometimes conflict can occur just simply because you, you never had the time to slow down and just get on the same page. Yep. So doing that on an ongoing basis may be an investment <clears throat> that you need to start making in your marriage. <clears throat> All right. We've already talked about this a little bit longer than maybe we maybe was listenable. What's, what's the next crucial financial decision? Kevin, I know you, we've been talking about college. Yeah. Yeah. So with college, when you look at that, it's it's very difficult to be completely objective about college. Um, and most people know when they have a child, they think, oh, well, is this child ever going to go to college? If they are going to go to college, what's it going to be like? And, you know, I've talked to folks that have said, look, my parents didn't help me with any of it, so I'm paying all of it for my child. I've talked to folks that said my parents didn't help me with any of it. It helped me. Yeah. Um, with make four years of college not just a consumption decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, hey, I need to make an investment. That With that investment in exchange, I need to be get skills that I can trade for money and skills that I can trade for even more money. So when you look at what, do I, what am I going to do after high school if I'm not going to go to work if I'm going to continue my education, the question is, what is the purpose of that education? And I had a client one time who was a sociology professor, and he said, look, college used to be kind of for the, the, the hoi polloi, the, the upper crust and um, the aristocrat class, and they would just send you know their kids, like, of course, you're going to go and get a liberal arts education so that you can you know run the trust fund well and stuff like this. And... Um, I don't know the, you know how much truth there is in that, but he made a case. There are a lot of kids that, that go to college that don't get a great benefit from the, the investment that they've made. And so he, he, what his encouragement was is figure out where, where you're going to go, what it's going to cost, and when you're done four years later, what are you going to walk out with that, that you can use two years later, four years later, I mean, who knows? But it's, mm-hmm. it's, so I think the investment decision, I would approach uh, my, my education, whether it's before college, whether you're sending your kids to a private school um, in K through 12, whether you're uh, whatever college, I would look and say, where are we going to strategically invest to get the best bang for our buck? That's such a different approach than what a high school student is going to naturally choose as well, right? Yeah, I mean, sure. these these colleges and universities, 
they're catering to to students more and more with um, the facilities and mm-hmm. the activities and a, almost a country club type of an experience because there is serious competition going on for students. There's just less of them to go around. And you could get lost in just the, the experience of the four years and and maybe completely forget about, oh, yeah, this is an investment for my future. I'm laying a foundation here. And so guiding your kids through that type of a discussion is really, really important. Not just sitting back and, um, you know, kind of taking a hands-off approach and letting them figure it out. Guide them, you know, help, help them make a, an adult decision on where they're going to go to school. Education has always been a, um, you know, how how do you gain skills and knowledge that you can then apply and trade for money in the marketplace? It's always been about that, I I believe. And it's just because of the costs rising so much and this now student loan crisis that we have, I feel like that decision is even more important and needs to be raised to a more of a conscious level. What are some of the other crucial financial decisions that you're going to face? We've got that and more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. All right, entering third segment. Again, I feel like there might be a little bit of application here with college. Yeah, well, you know, mapping it out with your CFP, what different education avenues cost and how to save up appropriately or how to plan for them appropriately. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, there's about $3 billion a year of scholarships that go unused. Wow. So, I mean, there's so many things that, that you could think out outside the box if you will allow yourself to get out the, the alternative funding sources, different mechanisms. <clears throat> mm-hmm. What are we hitting after that? Emergency fund? When to have kids? When to have kids? Sure. It's good. Third segment and fourth is auto owners. I mean, we can continue talking about this, but we need to at least hit a question I'd, I'd love it if we could transition to questions third se- or fourth segment mm-hmm. so, sure <clears throat> all right <clears throat> how you're going to help your kids or grandkids with education really the your kids and grandkids education decision financial decision around how they're going to get educated one of the crucial financial decisions they're going to make in their lives and you as well we're helping with that right now this is the wise money show with Corhorn financial group thanks for being here my name is mike bernard with me in the kfg studios kevin Corhorn and josh gregory stay up to date on all wise money content find us online wisemoneyshow.com and then all of our social media wherever you're you're at we are there as well just search the wise money show Hitting, uh, you know, kind of 2.0 follow up discussion to last week's discussion on crucial financial decisions, those outsized financial decisions where stakes are high, emotions run strong and getting making the wrong choice could have dire financial consequences. We're talking about education really quick before we pivot and meeting with someone this long, long time ago, early in my career, who um, wanted to be a dentist. Fantastic. Fabulous profession, and uh, if you're passionate about it, and if you can stand kind of gross stuff, great. <laughs> you know, go, go after, go after it. Well, it turns out financially, she wasn't prepared and for this dream, and um, got about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in student loan debt to pursue it. Okay, you know, no problem. Time to get to work. Within one year of graduating, um, she and her husband decide to start a family. It's going to make it harder to financially mm-hmm. to uh to 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 pay the student loans and get that return and but still again no no problem um but then shortly after that it was i don't want to go back to work full time i want to work two days a week and guys you you know i'm not i'm not judging we're not judging if those are your life decisions that's no problem um and years decades later has made no progress on the student loans because when mm. from investing into this career or excuse me, investing into the knowledge that then didn't parlay into a career that was able to mm-hmm. perform in such a way to pay for the education and then some. Yeah. So. If I could wave a magic wand, I would, I would make almost everything an apprenticeship because that way, because the same way if you're working with a contractor and he says it's going to be, $10,000 to put a deck on the back of your house. Um, what you probably wouldn't do is write him a check for ten grand on the spot and say, here, take this money. Because his incentive to 
finish the job, just it goes down. It's not a it's not a knock on a contractor. It's just that's human nature. And so if you get that far in, I mean, think of think of the student that went to a prestigious, very expensive university to be pre-med and graduated with a journalism degree mm-hmm. and yeah. a couple hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt. Yeah. Now, you, you better be winning some Pulitzer Prizes <laughs> if you're going to pay that off. So so this is this is where you. you you know, if you're if you're doing any kind of building, you're like, well, don't let the money get too far ahead of the work. Yeah. Well, with school, it's like, no, it's all paid up front. And then if I realize, hey, I want to tap the brakes and have some children. I want to work two days a week. Yeah, it, it becomes almost impossible. And if you haven't quantified the necessary sacrifice to achieve the things that you need to do financially, it it will it will drag on forever. And those folks probably haven't made a payment on their student loans mm-hmm. for the past two years. Well, that could be true for the student or the parent as well, because, yeah. you know, I, how many parents start out helping their kids with school and they don't really have a game plan for when does my help end and the students, my, my child's uh, responsibility pick up? And the the risk is, you know, you, you start writing checks and the money's flowing and everything and you don't you haven't quantified what is the sacrifice that I'm making? What am I giving up down the road potentially by maybe overfunding my, my kid's education, providing too much of the help? Do you know um, what the the expense will be, what the price tag is for your retirement goal, for example? Do you know how much you should be saving for your, your retirement goal? Some of the dollars that you might be helping your kids with education on might be retirement dollars and you don't even know it. And so, you know, it's important. And college is, is one of the, the examples of why it's, um, it's so critical that you make these decisions like how much am I going to contribute to their education? Make that decision in the context of your overall financial plan. Yep. I agree. Now this parlays, let's hit it quickly, but one of the biggest financial decisions you're going to make in your life is whether to have kids, when to have kids. Now this, there's an axiom out there. If you, if you wait to have kids uh, until you're financially ready, you'll never have kids. So you're never fully, fully prepared. However, we've joked oftentimes uh, on the Wise Money Show that the secret to um, a financially free future is just not have kids. Uh, they're just they're so, 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 so expensive. So expensive. Um, but, uh, but when you decide to start a family, that is one of the biggest decisions, your financial decisions you're going to make in your life. And doing so, even if it's not, the timing isn't perfectly planned or whatever, you can still thrive financially through it. And, um, I think of three bank account system. Mm-hmm. I think of working with the CFP to make sure you're aware of what things change and what things um, will stay the same and should stay the same. Like, hey, keep saving aggressively towards that retirement goal, still keep paying down debt. But then also what things change? Well, we've got to recalibrate the budget to make room for that second mortgage, i.e. child care, um, or recalibrate the budget to have less income because uh, someone will be staying home or being part-time, something like that, mm-hmm. and then got to add in that college savings if that's the goal. So. Yeah, you're rattling off a list of things that may be uh, preliminary goals, things you want to get done before having kids. Uh, it, it's common for young couples to come into our office and they'll say their overarching goal right now, it's not retirement, it's starting a family. Mm-hmm. And so you, you get to work thinking about, okay, what are the checklist of items or events or milestones that we want to achieve before baby number one comes along. And, and you mentioned a whole bunch of them. It's basically get your foundation in order. Yeah. You, I, I might add another one. Uh, is there a certain portion of your debt that you want to have eliminated? Maybe you want to be done with your student loans before you have kids. But it takes 10 years to pay off student loans. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have to. That might be the schedule that they set for you, but can you choose your own schedule? Absolutely. You know, you, you could have that paid off. Maybe you want to be out of any credit card debt or any other consumer debt like a car loan or something. I mean, for us, the car loan didn't fit with child care. I, ra- I ran the budget. When you find out you're starting a family, you need to run three budgets. The budget between now and the time the baby arrives, the budget for the first three months, maternity, they'll, you'll have higher expenses. You might not have all your income back. You might, you might not have all the expenses. And then the life after baby, 
budget. And when I built that one, it they couldn't coexist. Child care and a car loan couldn't coexist. And so that sharpened our focus. And during the, I don't know, the, the I, whatever, eight months that were left, seven months that were left before the baby came, we just figured out how much do we need to pay each month to get this car loan paid off, and we got it done. Mm-hmm. So You know, um, you might throw into this list of things to get done before kids as well. Figure out where you want to live. You know, if you need to be closer to family, is that a relocation to a different town, maybe back to your hometown or something? Is it a certain neighborhood that you want to live in because you want to be in a specific school system? And I'll tell you, there's a lot of folks that we've observed over the years who they they don't figure out where they want to live. They start having kids and then they almost get into crisis mode where it's like, boy, I, I don't like the, the neighborhood we're in because of the peer group or because of the the school that they have to go to. And before you know it, you're you're almost forced into making a decision. You, you feel forced in on a private school or relocate at a bad time, that, that kind of thing. Big. Those are big financial decisions. All right. There's a few here that we haven't that we haven't hit. Your Social Security decision. Your CFP's got to help you optimize Social Security. Making that decision is sort of a permanent decision. Guys, over your lifetime, hundreds of thousands of dollars could be at stake here. If you've got a pension, how to draw your pension, that's one of the biggest financial decisions that you're going to make in your life. Certainly how much emergency fund to have. The big idea is work with your CFP who's doing comprehensive financial planning. They can help you know which financial decisions are more important than the others and help guide you in making the wise choice in each of them. All right, we've got more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. We can hit that little summary again at the beginning of the next segment if we want, or we can just get right into questions. Seems like you wrapped it up pretty nice there. All right, sorry. Um, Okay, so questions are now in Teams. Wise Money Show Channel, channel, and then there's Question Bank at the top. And um, the first one we're going to hit is highlighted there. And then there's a few questions that pertain to health insurance that we could hit after that. But we could take this question, the highlighted one, and add on. So think of maybe a different angle to, or a follow-up question connected to it or something like that. Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name's Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Uh, Every episode of the Wise Money Show is on podcast wherever you listen. You can subscribe or follow us there and then do us a favor, rate the program there. We appreciate that. That's helpful feedback for us, but also helps others who are looking for content on wise financial principles, financial habits, uh, helps them find us. So we appreciate that. Check out the Wise Money Show on, on podcast. Just search the Wise Money Show. All right, so we're getting into questions from fans of the show. I want to thank Auto Owners Insurance for sponsoring this segment of the program. We appreciate that. Several questions here. You guys know uh, that, that, you know, we tend to run a little bit lengthy in our discussions and and don't get to questions each and every week. First one here comes from fan of the show, Ron. So curious what your thoughts are about personal umbrella policy limits, what those should be. Currently, I have a $3 million umbrella, but my total net worth is now over $5 million. Should I increase my umbrella coverage? Guys, what do you think? Uh, great, great question. Um, uh, let's start by maybe explaining why you would have an umbrella yeah. in, in particular. Um, you know, anyone who's a homeowner or you drive a car, you're going to have insurance on those, on the vehicle, on the house, that sort of thing, in case there's some sort of damage that happens to that asset or more importantly, from a financial planning standpoint, if there's some sort of a, an event that occurs, you know, you're behind the wheel and you slide through the wrong stop sign and you injure someone or worse, and now you've created financial pain in someone else's life, there's a portion of your, your automobile insurance called liability coverage that helps to protect against those types of events. How do you make someone whole when you've damaged them financially? Well, here's, here's the issue. A, a car policy may have typically uh, up to a half a million dollars worth of this liability coverage. And we can think of all kinds of events that could occur that would be way more damage that you caused to someone than just a half a million bucks worth of 
of, uh, of pain, you know, surgeries, a, a death, um, disability, that, that kind of thing. And so an umbrella policy is what you put above and beyond the, the homeowners and the, the car insurance to provide extra liability protection. This is more money um, from the insurance company at your disposal if the wrong event occurs. And typically, you know, the first level of an umbrella policy is a million bucks. Mm-hmm. But you don't have to stop there. You can go to two million or three million. And uh, often we say, boy, you want to be uh, setting that limit in, in a way that kind of matches or, or aligns with your overall net worth? Like, what do you have at risk here? Yeah, what's your, finan- what's your overall financial exposure? Um, that's one. And then you also need to be, keep in mind, what are the, what's, it's a risk management decision, ultimately. Yeah. So how, what, are the, what are the chances that you're, you could face risk it, or, or a lawsuit, a liability this, at this level. Yeah, it's too simplistic to say, well, I have a $2 million net worth, so I want to have a $2 million umbrella policy. Because the reality is you could cause an event that is a $4 million event, right? You, you know, you wipe out a car full of surgeons on their way to some conference or something. Or multi-car pileup, right? I mean, it's frightening, frightening yeah. stuff. And yet all of that adds up very, very, very quickly. That's right. Yeah, and and so when you look at that, you say, all right, well, if your total assets ex- are are greater than the amount of your umbrella policy, is that of a concern? And really, as you think about risk management, you're you're on risk right now. You write a check to the insurance company. Now you are off risk, and the insurance company is on risk. And again, the underlying coverage is considerably more expensive than the umbrella, which goes over the top. An umbrella f- for what you get is very affordable. And so you say, well, why, why on a relative basis is my umbrella so affordable? Because the likelihood of you using it is so low. Mm-hmm. It, it's the same reason why the accidental death and dismemberment insurance that you can get through your group work policy is so inexpensive. Um, so you look at it, one consideration is, what do I have as far as total assets? Another w- would be, though, as well, like, what is my future income? So if I have mm-hmm. if if I'm a high earner and I've got 20 more years to be a high earner, then I might want to um, play defense a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, it, and and this is where you want to be. You want to have a plan for your risk management portfolio to say how how do I approach this and and make your decision because the. The, the, the possibility, if you've got a $3 million umbrella, of having an event that goes north of $3 million, it's possible. It's not mm-hmm. probable. Right. And so statistically, you're like, well, it's, it's somewhat unlikely. And then the other question is, okay, how many of those am I going to have? Because once that happens, once your umbrella policy pays out, and we've seen this, that company says, hey, look, uh, thanks for your business. We're no longer going to insure you um, at, at your renewal. So this is where you're. you're You've you're, totally freaked uh, a few people out right there. But unfortunately, that is sa- uh, sadly how it could work. Yeah, I, well, and I would tell people there's no there's no reason to get freaked out at all. This is. I mean, I I would take a very calm, very unemotional approach to this. I mean, you can get a, a million dollar umbrella. You can get a hundred million dollar umbrella. I mean, you could, and but I mean, you could spend all of your money trying to insure against something that that might never happen. Mm-hmm. I think it's important also to to have a conversation with your certified financial planner about your overall insurance package and what are the risks that are unique to your life. You know, people who live on a lake and uh, do a lot of boating, y- you have a greater risk of a bad event happening, right? Now, you're going to be careful and you're going to have fun and uh, and all of that. But the, the reality is, um, boy, accidents in the water can turn catastrophic pretty, pretty quickly. We have a swimming pool at our house. And we had just this summer, um, I think it was about 50 youth group kids over at our house. They're all in the pool. And we narrowly narrowly escaped two broken necks that night. Oh, my night. goodness. One. You and Andrea getting so, like, whose idea was this to invite <laughs> all these kids no. over? It was, was that utter it? chaos. That's a lot of humans in a swimming pool at, at one time. Yeah. But 
you know, the kids jumping off the diving board onto other kids and, uh, you know, near drownings there. But one kid was going to do his very first backflip at my house oh, off my diving board, and he didn't clear the diving board. So he smashed his face so well. I mean, it, it was... Oh, it looked like he was going to have two black eyes, a face just completely mangled. It, it was pretty rough. Didn't shed a tear, though. Wow. One of the toughest kids there, I'm sure. Wow. But I, I thought, man, that, that could have ended very, very differently. Mm-hmm. And I, I actually talked to our insurance uh, agent, one of our specialists here, and I said, you know, what, what kind of liability ex- exposure did I really have there? And she said, oh, absolutely, that, that would have been on you. Mm-hmm. Even though we, you know, I, I wasn't egging the kid on. But we were there. It was at our house, and someone getting injured. We didn't stop it from happening. Was the idea? So, in, in this case, I, you're you're bringing up I, to me the absolute valid considerations. You know, what's your net worth? What's your overall financial exposure? Is that is, is that br- greater than your net worth? And then the other sort of intangibles in your, or maybe tangibles in your fi- in your financial life. Uh, you know, do, do, uh, you, do you have kids? What's um, you know boats? Pool, yeah. do you trampoline. Have, well, yeah. Do you, do you have a home? Do you have a swimming pool? Do you drive a car? Do you have young drivers in your home? Do you do you employ uh, a housekeeper, nanny, gardener, other people on your premises? Do you have a dog? Do you regularly entertain in your home? Do you serve on the board of a not-for-profit and they don't have DNO insurance? Um, mm-hmm. My my temptation would be, I, you, you've got to consider all those. Work with your CFP. I I wouldn't hesitate going from three million to five million. Because it probably won't cost you very much. Mm-mm. Probably the first million is the most expensive, and it doesn't double the cost of the umbrella to go to two million. Right. Mm-hmm. Doesn't even often double it to go to three, maybe even four. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't. I, you know, that's not outsized. Now, talk to your CFP. That's not. That's not a substitute for having a, a, a discussion with your with your CFP. What about underlying limits, guys? Let's 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 turn the corner. Josh, you said. A lot of times, the liability coverage built into your um, into your auto owner's policy or your homeowner's policy, you know, you said eh, maybe a half million dollars. Well, that's a decision that mm-hmm. you need to make. There's there's state minimums, but then we see a lot of times people either have a hundred thousand of liability or three hundred thousand of liability. How do you make that decision? Well, to me, if you're going to go to an umbrella, that decision might be made for you at, at some yeah. level, because a lot of times the insurance company will say, you have to have at least this minimal level of, of underlying coverage before we'll add another layer on top of it. And that minimal coverage might be 250000 It might be a half a million. It, it depends on your insurance company. So, so figure that out. But if you were going to operate without an umbrella at all, just know uh, most policies would naturally go to a half a million dollar policy. Some might even let you write something called a million dollar combined single limit policy, which is basically a way to package all of the different coverages into a million bucks. It could be a million dollars that mostly goes towards liability. It could be a million dollars that gets used to fix someone's Lamborghini. Uh, you, you know, it it's used in in more ways is the idea, as opposed to splitting up or segmenting off the different types of coverage in a, a more traditional policy. I see on on average, if I get a blanket statement, your financial situation is unique to you, um, but just a blanket statement, people tend to have too little underlying liability coverage. Without it, and and, mm-hmm. and it's not because, well, compare that to your net worth. No, just compare it to the financial exposure. We all, if you own a car and are driving, we all have the chance that you could cause an accident. And when you, if you cause a, an accident, a severe accident, you know, $100,000 can get used up quickly, right? very quickly. If anyone has to go to the hospital and have any sort of surgery, miss anywhere, I mean, that, that 100000 gets used up quickly. And so I don't think you need to, the underlying limits, I don't think you need to do this e- elaborate analysis to realize, yeah, hundred thousand is probably not going to cut it. Right. Three hundred thousand is probably not going to cut it. To me, I would start with the assumption that your auto coverages should start at a half million dollars, and the underlying general liability within your home should start at a half million. Kevin, would you add anything to that? No, I. But I'm a big believer in uh, getting the right amount of insurance, and then I actually like to take just cut a thick slice and say, listen. 
as much as I don't like to pay the premium, I'm not going to miss it, but I will miss it in the event that it happens. Mm-hmm. And I was just talking to a guy that had a $400,000 plus loss, mm-hmm. and he he actually was insured by auto owners and talking about what a great job they were doing in settling the claim. Hmm. Uh, so, um, yeah, I what you the coverage that's available, I mean, the it, insurance is part of what makes our economy work. Because hmm. it, it it allows you for a very small premium to have incredible protection. To, to transfer the risk. As yeah. you're making progress in your financial life, building up wealth, what hedges can you put in place that if something unfortunate happens, it doesn't doesn't um, wreck all the financial progress you've made? That's, that's the insurance decisions. That's all the time we have for today. On behalf of Josh Gregory, Kevin Corhorn, all of us at KFG, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group. KFG Wealth Management, LLC and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.